As you said, I'm here to talk about practical attacks on payment gateways. Um, I found, tried to find a funnier picture to put on. Um, unfortunately, there aren't that many funny pictures when it comes to online shopping um, or payment gateways. Um, it only took me until today to sort of realize that there might actually be some people in this room who doesn't know what a floppy drive is. So um, <laughs> I think I'm showing my age a bit. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, so what we're here to talk about today is just sort of a quick introduction. What are payment gateways? Why am I doing this talk? Um, what are some of the weaknesses that um, I've observed while pen testing? Um, talk more in details about some of the attacks that you can do against payment gateways. Um, and we'll have a conclusion demo at the end. So, um, wall of text comes from Wikipedia. Um, essentially, what it says is that uh, payment gateways is the point of sale system for online shops, basically. Um, the way to take payment from customers. Uh, father of two, um, married, and um, I'm a geek, nerd, whatever. Um, I write a blog, which I don't update nearly as often as I should. Um, but occasionally there might be something interesting on there. Um, it's uh, just another hacker.com in case you're wondering. So, um, <clears throat> why talk about payment gateways or attacking payment gateways? Um, essentially, I believe that security researchers are here to improve things in the long run. Um, you know, we might have some fun and break things yeah, on the way to get there. But um, the end game should be, you know, more secure service. Um, bad guys, obviously, bad guys. That's a broad term. Um, they have different interest in security. Um, so essentially, um, for them, it's about you know, monetary gains, um, fraudulent transactions against web shops to receive. Good services, which or you know, paying very little for good services, depending on the attack, uh, which you can then use to you know, host another phishing scam, make more money, or you know, just sell basically stolen goods. Um, it's more time-consuming and probably has less of a return on in, in investment compared to just straight up um, banking trojans or credit card trojans or you know, breach of. Major corporation that stores credit cards in the plain text in the database, um, which is a lot easier to convert into cash. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't really see attacks on payment gateways, um, in, because you, know, you just you just run a trojan through a you know, polymorphic transform and release it again and get another bunch of credit cards or you know, operational botnet that you can make money on. Um, so, um, according to Payment Gateways, the scenario today is that Payment Gateways are easy to use. Um, they support things like you know, iframe shopping carts or iframe checkout pages. Um, very easy to implement. You don't really need to modify anything on your end. You just chuck in an iframe and yeah, away you go. You're, you're a PCI compliant shop. You're great. Um, quite often that means that the transaction details are in the URL, which I guess it may or may not be a concern depending on you know, where you sit. Um, they support developers. You know, they, they provide documentation, they provide source code, shopping cart integrations, API libraries, um, all valuable information to both developers and, and attackers. Um, and hey, they're secure. Usually most payment gateways are PCI compliant. All the big ones are you know, tier one, level one PCI compliant. Um, and you know, as long as they store the database or the credit card details for you, they take the payment details, you don't have to be PCI compliance because you know, it's, it's out of scope. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about PCI compliance at all uh, because yeah, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, they also provide something called request validation or tamper proofing, which is there to prevent people from doing fraudulent transactions uh, by making it yeah, secure or uh, at the very least. You know, harder for the guys to do it. Um, they tend to use SSL, um, although you may or may not find uh, consistent implementation of SSL, which um, is a concern. So, um, testing pay payment gateways. Um, I've never actually tested a payment gateway in a, in a penetration testing 
engagement, all the testing that I've done have been in a third party type of engagement where you know, customer X is using payment gateway Y. Um, I've never actually tested a payment gateway in a, in a penetration testing engagement. All the testing that I've done have been in a third party type of engagement where you know, customer X is using payment gateway Y as part of their penetration test to their online shop. Um, we really need to test the payment methods because otherwise, I mean, you're doing them a great disfavor. Uh, if they can't receive payments reliably, then they don't really have a business model. Uh, and if you're responsible for pen testing that, you, you really should do you know, the due course. So the approach to that is usually to do passive type pen testing. You, you, you fire up burp, whatever you, you do a payment on a valid credit card, or you just use one of these test numbers, um, and you, you basically just monitor the traffic that's going through. If you see something that you sort of, you go, hang on, that's not quite right. right? You're sending HTML in the URL, or and it's appearing in the page across its scripting font. Um, you can usually contact the customer and get them to contact the payment gateway. You can contact the payment gateway directly and just say, you know, here's the, here's the scenario I'm pen testing for this customer. We think we find a security problem in your payment gateway. Can we please get permission to test the following items, blah, 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 in this time frame? And I, that usually works out. Um, so uh, um, essentially, all the, all the vulnerabilities identified um, later on, they all come from passive testing. I've, I've, I've never actually gone out and done active attacks on, on payment gateways uh, in any way, shape, or form. So um, there's probably a lot more vulnerabilities out there if, if somebody were to go looking. So um, how does payment gateways work? Well, um, this is looking at sort of a iframe um, redirect style transaction. It starts up with the browser sends a request to the checkout page on the merchant website. So you know, you, you've been browsing around, you find a couple of t-shirts you like, you're ready to pay, you go to the checkout page. That will then either send you a HTML source that contains an iframe to the payment gateways URLs, or it'll redirect you straight there. At which case, your browser sends another request to the payment gateway saying, please give me you know, the checkout form or payment details. You get a form back that says, you know, please enter your credit card details, blah, 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 blah. Um, you submit that, and it goes, hopefully, over SSL to the payment gateway. And then they will return you, usually, a, a redirect back to the merchant gateway with some sort of payment received message so that the merchant gateway, who hasn't seen any of the transaction between you and the payment gateway, can know that, hey, payment was actually received. Oh, this money should be appearing in my account. So then the browser goes back to the merchant website, who usually displays like a thank you for shopping with us, you know, here's your order number or here's who to call if you, if you don't get your shipment of t-shirts. Um, so. That's really covering the basics of, of payment gateways. We'll, we'll come back to particularly the transaction stuff a bit later. Um, so what have we seen in the wild? Well, process scripting, that one's usually to be expected. I mean, you know, is there a website in the world that doesn't have cross-site scripting on it at some point in time? Um, information disclosure, again, yeah, um, usually it can be from you know, sort of helpful error messages to uh, here's a stack trace. Um, directory traversal, that one's pretty bad, especially if you store the logs in the web root and the logs contain transaction details. Uh, negative numbers, that's an old goodie. You know, get some money put back onto your credit card by charging yourself some negative numbers. Um, exposure of credit card numbers, um, usually that just comes down to sort of yeah, ver verification page, please verify the details you've entered and then, you know, allow cache. Uh, not so good. Um, configuration issues, that sort of broad covers things like, you know, uh, HTTP only cookies, secure cookies. Um, I've, I've, I've never tested a payment gateway that didn't have at least one issue. Um, there are more issues, usually sort of minor. Um, I think the reason why we don't see stuff like yeah, SQL injection on here is because, again, I haven't had permission 
to attack the payment gateway URL. Um, it's not because you know, they're secure necessarily. Um, so, um, what are some of the basic attacks that you can attack? Um, someone, when you're doing a payment like this, details are in the URL, it's an iframe or it's a redirect. Yeah. Uh, fire up burp, intercept the request, change the payment amount, right? put in a negative number or just you know, zero dollars a cent. Um, change the currency. So if you're unable to change the payment amount, you might be able to pay in, you know, yens or Italian lira or something that, that's not <laughs> as valuable as uh, you know, US or Australian dollars. Um, tampering with the return URL, well, probably not as efficient for, you know, fraudulent transactions, but um, it quite frequently the return URL will end up in an open redirect because it's just the way they're implemented. They, they really have to accept, just accept that risk. Um, so sometimes you might be able to just do a you know, spoof a payment URL, change the return URL to go to a phishing page, and because you've inputted some invalid data, it'll just take you back to the return URL without showing the payment gateway form and stuff. But, um, at the end of the day, it's not really that much different from sending somebody an email saying, your payment was cancelled, please click on this link. I mean, it's, it's phishing. Um, and of course, you know, spoof transaction complete because the merchant website, as we saw in the transaction details, doesn't know whether or not you actually communicated with the merchant website at all. So, uh, if we look at this, essentially, if you're tampering with things like the, the currency or the um, amount paid, it will be where that red arrow happens. And so, you know, you'll change the payment amount from $120 down to dollar twenty, go through and actually just complete the transaction as normal. Um, it goes back to the merchant website and it goes, yeah, payment was received for transaction ID X, even though the payment amount doesn't match the shopping cart amount. And they'll just go, oh yeah, transaction ID matches, fine, here's your ship, you know, we'll ship your t-shirts. Um, or alternately, you just go straight down there and go, yeah, I paid. Yeah, he, he said, here's the token that says I paid. And they'll go, oh yeah, you provided the token, it seems legit ship them some t-shirts. Um, so uh, um, they implemented something called request validation or tamper proofing to, to solve that. And basically it's a, it's a HMAC fingerprinting signature, whatever. It, it takes like a hash digest of the URL or the details that you're sending to the payment gateway. And if you change any of that, then the hash doesn't m match anymore. And, and so, you know, obviously it's a fraudulent transaction or you've done something wrong. Um, so, um, when you want to attack a payment gateway, it's a good idea to start with what the vendor provides. Uh, for example, you can identify vulnerabilities in the documentation, example source code that they provide, API libraries, shopping cart code. I mean, if, if you identify something in the shopping cart code, you just go out and find it in the wild and just you know, go nuts. If you're a bad guy. Obviously, you know, us ethical penetration testers don't do that. Um, so here's some examples that I've taken from uh, vendor resources. Here's a customer activation example. Um, if you know PHP and you're able to read it, uh, you'll see what it does. If you can't read it, it, essentially it gets two variables provided by the user known as customer reference and subscription reference. Um, if those contain anything, doesn't actually check that they need to match anything, it will open a file based on your customer reference data provided and write the details you submitted as subscription reference data. So essentially you can, as long as the web server has write permissions, you can write arbitrary data to an arbitrary file on the file system. Um, it's very handy if you're trying to get shell on a PHP installation. Um, they also have a, a similarly great um, account deactivation example, which, which basically just takes the customer reference provided by you know, the browser or the user. And then straight down here in the bottom, it just goes, delete the file that contains this customer reference. No checking. So, you know, nice and easy. Just start deleting files on the server. So, Great. 
Um, shopping carts, um, they're not exactly secure by any means. I mean, any software eventually has bugs. Um, this is uh, a graph of the uh, statistics for shopping cart at uh, the open source vulnerability database. As, as you can see, there's a fairly large chunk of SQL injection. Um, there's a fair bit of cross site scripting, which isn't arguably that interesting. Um, it's a fair chunk of other. That other category is, is actually very interesting. Um, File inclusion, which is always bad. Information disclosure. Um, I think my favorite is, is this sort of purpley bit at the top, 2%, um, which is buffer overflow. Uh, and it's essentially just compiled CGI binaries that are vulnerable to buffer overflow, which is just probably too old to be seen in the wild today, but it's yeah, pure onage. So um, this other category contains things like I've said before, transaction complete with incomplete payment or yeah, the wrong amount of payment and they'll just ship you t-shirts. Your transaction ID matches and the status is paid regardless of what the amount is. Price manipulation, yeah, always a, a stable for, for this. Um, remote command injection, arbitrary code execution, authentication bypass, just you know, log straight into the admin panel, download, download a list of customers or credit card details. Um, customer database exposure, just hit the customer database directly, you know, like access database sitting in some directory without any sort of protection, just download it. It's all good. Um, arbitrary file upload and format string, which again, it's going back to the days of you know, compiled CGI um, binaries. So probably won't see too much of that in the wild either. Um, And I don't know if you can read this, but um, the interesting bit is down on line 115, which is just here, where in the API request to the payment gateway, they just disable SSL validation. Yeah, don't worry about that. You know, somebody serving, pretending to be us with a self-signed certificate. Yeah, that's fine. I'm sure it's legit. Um, so this could probably be used in sort of a hypothetical scenario, uh, DNS cache poisoning against the hosting company, um, or even better, if, I mean, if it's a hosting company, they usually host their own DNS, and they allow you to set domains in their DNS before the domain is active with them, because you know, that's how it transfers from hosting company to hosting company works. So essentially, just sign up an account pretending to be payment gateway, set up the domain on their servers, they serve the domain name records for it. Their web servers probably query their own name service. And yeah, Bob's your uncle. Next thing you know, you're getting credit card details. You don't even have to modify them. You just intercept them, um, record credit card numbers, and, and yeah, just proxy it on. Um, all right. Now. And then request validation. This is uh, probably the bulk of my talk. Um, it's the thing that keeps us or keeps payment gateways secure from all these normal attacks of manipulating prices and um, things. And Wikipedia describes it as uh, validation that's a hash of the parameters that are important in the transaction and a secret word, like a password. Right? Um, and it's only known to the merchant and the payment gateway. That's, that's fine, you know. Uh, passwords are usually secret, and when you share them with two parties, you can do some fun things. I mean, crypto's proven that. Um, all right. So when you're faced with a payment gateway that does request validation, you have a few options. Um, you can try to bypass the request validation. Um, you can attack the hashing algorithm, um, or you can attack the request validation process itself. Um, so. Bypassing the request validation, perfect example, HTTP parameter pollution. Um, don't know if you'll actually find any of this in the, in the world. Uh, it, it's a pain to actually detect unless you have uh, white hat, the white box type of access. Uh, but essentially it is that you, you provide the URL as provided by the merchant gateway saying, you know, this is the amount you pay, this is the hash, this is the currency, and then you pad on the end, amount. Um, and so, you, Hopefully what happens is the, the payment gateway goes through, checks 
and uses the first amount because you know, it's PHP. So here amount checks it against the hash. Yeah, that's all fine. Converts it to XML, does a sub call, and then suddenly the sub call references the last amount, which is you know, one cent. So you bypassed the request validation process because it actually matches, but at time of use or time of charge, um, the parameter pollution kicks in and you, you get in charge a different amount. Um, there's no way, un, un, unless, unless you you're basing, completely encode the whole transaction details, so it's like base64 and then hash that, or like you completely have to change the way um, that these requests are mean, made in order to, to have request validation protect against parameter pollution. Um, I'm using unprotected parameters, so quite often you'll find that uh, it'll protect the payment amount, transaction type, the, the currency, the date, transactions being done, all these other things. And then they usually have a bunch of configurable or custom input fields because people use payment gateways to sell things like you know, subscription to magazines or uh, things that have you know, required data to be passed back and forth that aren't necessarily part of the standard operating model of the payment gateway. So what you can do, say, in the case of a magazine subscription or you know, you're buying hosting or something, just set the expiry date 100 years ahead. Yeah. It's fine, you pay for one month, one year, whatever, and then you get 100 years worth of yeah, service in return. So um, while that isn't necessarily changing the amount you pay, you, you certainly you, you pay a lot less per year on average if you get 100 years for the price of one. Um, abusing application logic, it's not so much directly on the uh, payment gateway, it's more related to like shopping carts where you can potentially abuse the, the logic of the shopping cart to say, oh, here's a debugging parameter, you know, validate order, and it's not normally provided by the payment gateway, but since we've read the source code, we'll just tack it on the end, don't worry about it, just trust what the browser say that, that I paid and, and you know, confirm my payment. And again, it yeah, can be used to spoof um, to payment successful messages. Sorry. It's getting a bit slow. There we go. Okay. If, if you were to attack the request validation algorithms, um, if they're using MD5, I suppose SHA1 as well, you, you can do the hash length attack where if one of the parameters is, for example, you know, uh, the customer name, you can usually just keep padding things to your name, like null bytes, until the hash will eventually match what it did before, even though you've changed, say, the amount. It's, it's not very practical, but um, uh, Julian Arisa and uh, Titan published working concepts for this and the API Flickr, or the Flickr API a, a while back. Um, there's, there's a lot of conditions that have to be met for this to actually be practical. In general, I mean, um, you can probably find SQL injection instead. Yeah. Um, and uh, hash mismatch, mismatch behavior goes back to what I said before with the return URL. Quite frequently they'll find that oh, something doesn't match. You've changed something, it's a fraudulent URL or transaction attempt, I'll take you back to the user supplied return URL, which is yeah, attacker supplied instead, and it's a phishing page. Um, that's pretty common. Um, oh, hang on. Let's go down here. Oh, actually, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, didn't realize the slides weren't updating, sorry. So there's the examples of what I spoke about before, parameter pollution, unprotected parameter, and of course, you know, application logic. Just you know, tack on the validate order bypass. Um, and yeah, again, um, attacking the hash length attack or you know, padding and uh, redirect, not very exciting, so. Um, Breaking the request validation, uh, we can actually execute brute force attacks on the request validation 
Um, there might be uh, there's, there's non plan tax in there right? because you know the amount that you're paying, you usually know the date that you're paying, uh, you might know the merchant ID, so you can definitely use that. Um, there's often weak entropy, so they'll convert like all the parameters to lowercase before they hash them or uppercase before they hash them just to avoid mistakes. Um, and, and so, yeah, entropy isn't that high. Um, the beauty of this is it can be done offline and you can usually do it without completing a transaction first. So, um, to show an example of this, the following shows a um, pretty standard type of request validation of you know, how to create a fingerprint. You, do a SHA-1 or MD5 of like a merchant ID, the password, which is the secret key known only to the merchant and, and the payment gateway. Transaction type, a reference ID, which is usually, you know, payment or the merchant website provides that. The amount, timestamp. Uh, in this case, as you can see, you would probably be free to modify the currency, even if you couldn't um, break this because the currency isn't included in the, in the hash. So you might not be able to change the amount, but yeah, change it to something that's not worth much and you're not paying the same anyway. So um, in this case, if the merchant ID is ABC0010, password is password123, very secure. Transaction type is zero, test reference is the reference, the amount is $100 and yeah. um, the timestamp is last month, then that's the hash that you get. Um, now, if you were on the checkout page and you were to look at the page source, you'd see a lot of hidden input fields. I've, I've chunked the HTML a bit to make it fit on the slide, so yeah, you get the point. Um, so the merchant ID, that's in there. The transaction type is in there. The reference ID is in there. The amount is in there. The timestamp is in there. And the hash is in there. Um, and the result the URL, which isn't protected, so you can always tamper with that. So, um, to summarize this, these are the details they're using to generate the hash. And then if we add the details that are in the form, I say there's a lot of the same information. Essentially, if we ignore all the fields that are identical, you end up with one unknown field, which is the password, and you have a known hash. That's pretty similar to breaking any type of hash, really. So you, you know, you, do a password, you, you hash it and see if the hashes match. So, <coughs> to add to this, the um, password is usually provided by the vendor or user specified. Um, there's usually no change requirements. Right? So if, if, if you're with the vendor for 20 years, your password for the API stays the same. Um, yeah, sometimes converted to upper lowercase, which yeah, hurts. Um, the, the complexity. Um, so if you were to do brute force, yeah, those are really your options. Um, yeah, usually about eight characters, which, yeah. Um, uh, the bottom one is, is one that I see a lot, which is essentially they just give you a hash. Like here's an MD5 hash and that's your, your secret key. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to see whether or not that hash correlates to your account password or anything fun. <laughs> Um, I don't always have great faith in developers, so that wouldn't really surprise me. All right, so once we've broken the request validation, we can perform SQL injection attacks because now the, we can sign a payment amount that contains apostrophes, um, you know, that wouldn't normally be possible otherwise. Um, we can alter the cost of the transaction, we can alter the currency, Again, depending on which payment gateway it is uh, and, and which parameters they protect. Um, or we can just spoof payment receive signatures, which is um, preferably what you want to do. And the reason why we can do that is because in addition to re request validation, they usually have a response validation, which is used to validate that the information that you claim came from the merchant gateway has been signed with a key known only to the merchant or the payment gateway, so that you know, random attacker wouldn't be able to know the key and thus wouldn't be able to sign the message saying that, yeah, I've received money, it's legit. 
Um, again, it's the same thing. Um, it's the merchant ID, it's the password, it's the reference ID, it's the amount, it's the timestamp, and then in this case, it's an additional summary code. And because the password's the same, once you break it, you know what it is. You just gotta know which fields to include, and again, yeah, that's where you go back to vendor documentation that will tell you all of this. So, time for a demo. I have a VM running a pretty common um, shopping cart. So I'm just going to log in to the admin panel. Luckily, my computer is really fast. Uh, might be a bit of waiting around for the demo, unfortunately. Uh, while that thing is doing its magic, go here. So this is essentially what it looks like. It's a uh, basic install of a web shop. Comes with some default products. In this case, we're looking at the MacBook Air. Oh, add a few of those to the cart. Three should do this, I think. Uh, and in the meantime, so we've been able to log in here. Let's see, go down here, check the orders. That's the default order that comes with the, with the web shop. Um, no, other, no other orders currently pending. So we go back here, go to shopping cart, just check out. Check out as a guest. Uh, yeah. Can't see what I'm typing, so just um, excuse any typos. Some rubbish details there. Save that. I'll accept the terms. All right. And then here's where you would normally fill out your details um, and, and ship that off to the payment gateway. But instead, we're just going to save the page. for this um, and then I'll just run this cracker and I get so as you can see it's extracting the non details from the the payment gateway like the the merchant ID the transaction type the amount the currency the hash the return URL and then basically in in order to make this execute in a 
you know, feasible amount of time, I'm using a dictionary attack instead of you know, straight up brute force attack. Um, my key is also longer than eight characters, but uh, it's not that important. Um, so yeah, this would normally be a lot faster. I've just added a bit of the del artificial delay, um, so it fits. Yeah. Um, and then, as you can see, it finds a match for the hash, and then it generates. A trans Actually, it doesn't generate a transaction ID. It uses the same transaction ID every time I, I do this, but the payment or the, the shopping cart doesn't seem to care that the same same guy pays for. <laughs> multiple things with the same transaction ID uh, because it's signed, so you know, you gotta trust it, it's legit. So then it generates the signed hash for it and it generates this URL, let's see if I can copy this without. So but before I go to this URL, I just wanted to confirm that This order hasn't been paid for yet. It shows up that we've got a, a new customer to the to the shop. Um, so what, once I go back here, open just a new tab, check that URL in there, and then this will take about a minute because it's trying to connect to the internet. Um, so you just gotta wait for DNS to time out. Um, and essentially, takes us back to the return URL with a signed message saying that, yes, I've received you know, almost $5,000 in payments, signed with a valid key, it's got valid transaction details that you know, match the application logic, the you know, transaction ID looks like a genuine transaction ID, uh, even though they've just taken it from the developer documentation. And then, eventually, one day this will complete. So probably we just knocked out the DNS and the host's file. But there we go. Right, as you can see down here, it says, you know, your order is complete. Nice and happy. And if we go back to the orders page here. See there it says, oh yeah, here's a new order. And down here, live demo, payment received, almost $5,000. And you know, hopefully they'll just ship me three MacBooks and everything's fine. <laughs> so, that takes us back to the very end of my presentation. So, in conclusion, don't rely on the browser to drive traffic between the merchant website and the payment gateway. It just, there will always be something. Um, always validate the transaction amount and payment status in a secondary request to the API. You know, don't trust what's being provided to you, just validate it. Um, and yeah, wait for payment to, res to clear before you actually send anything off. Like, you know, don't just go, yeah, I'm expecting five grand. Or, Probably be fine. Here's some MacBooks. Um, and yeah, for the love of God, use more than one unknown variable in the request, request validation, or at least make the password hugely long and, and have you know some change requirements in there so that people can't just take it offline like I did. Just you know, save the checkout page or come back in a week. There's the password. You know. Um, the thing is that just because you have a weak request validation in the payment gateway doesn't mean that you have a vulnerability because things like you know, waiting for payments to clear or checking the transaction detail in the secondary request will mitigate the attack that I just demoed. So, uh, any questions? Yep? How's PayPal doing with that? Sorry? How's PayPal doing with all of that? I haven't actually looked at PayPal that much in detail, but um, from what I have read, they, they seem to rely on secure tokens. So you send a request to PayPal saying that these are the transaction details, and then they redirect you to a URL that has a secure token in there. And so they already know what the amount is, the payment currency, everything like that. It doesn't actually transmit 
by the user. So should, they should be safe. Say so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's been a long time since I used PayPal like that, but it would, um, I guess, to mitigate the, the back and forth so much, you'd set up a URL within the PayPal that will send an instant payment notification directly to the website. Yep. Uh, so therefore, any anything that the client browser gets to say uh, transaction true or false would be uh, ignored anyway by well, the website. <coughs> They're not the only payment we get where they does that. The thing is that since you're cutting out the payment gateway component, so you're not going to the payment gateway and paying. If you know what the return URL is, you can just connect to it directly and say, yeah, I'm PayPal, he paid. And then, you know, if, if they, don't, they don't usually have a, a limitation that the notification URL has to be restricted access by a IP or, or you know, username and password or whatever, it's just like, the return URL gets some data and it usually believes it, more or less. Yeah. So uh, there are ways around that too. Any more questions? Yes, well done here. MasterCard has required uh, the payment gateway to talk to the hosting company for about 15 years. How often is this really happening? Because I know uh, I run a payment gateway and we've got some clients who don't do this, but they're charities. They don't care what amount you're donating. They just want an amount, yeah. and they're happy with that. And we get special um, write-offs for them, so they allow that we can allow that. But um, is anybody really doing this in the modern world today? Because all the all the payment gateways we compete with require this back-channel communication as well. Yeah, he heaps of them do just straight up. Let's rely on the browser to direct traffic between you know, X, Y, Z. Um, Major ones in Australia, in Europe, in the US, all do it. Um, they tend to rely on this the you know, request response validation method to operate in a secure fashion. The but like I said, even though even if this like a direct if if this direct API so that the browser isn't involved, then yeah, you don't have this issue. Uh, I think though, like I said earlier, we don't see exploitation of this because you know at the end of the day. You can maybe, if you're lucky, get a couple of MacBooks off a site and then that's sort of it, and then you have to deal with getting the shipment, you know, selling them again, blah, blah, blah. Whereas, you know, hey, let's just make a botnet or you know, steal some credit cards from a database. Uh, it seems to be that it's too much hard work, I don't know, uh, or you know, not enough return on investment for the organized crime to do this, but I could be wrong. Anyone else? All right, big round of applause.